Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here with us today. I'd like to thank DP World and to our speakers who are joining us both uh, in person and virtually for this session. I'm Nada Raza, director of the Al Sarkal Arts Foundation. And today's event, Practices of Care and Commoning, is part of Cultures in Conversation, an unconventional series of conversations, experiences, and artistic interventions commissioned by Expo 2020 and programmed by Al Sarkal Advisory. Cultures in Conversation sits within Expo's comprehensive program for people and planet, a talk series organized into 10 theme weeks. Today's presentations are part of the week devoted to health and wellness. The seven of 10 theme weeks, this is in association with the World Health Organization and Mohammed bin Rashid University. In partnering with Expo to conceptualize cultures and conversation, Al Sakal Advisory has worked with multidisciplinary artists and thinkers, creating a program that reimagines critical contemporary issues. Engaging with these topics more laterally, more creatively, the program opens up unexpected avenues of questioning and reflection. Today, for example, we're listening to people whose work is deeply engaged with the notion of mutuality, of interdependence, and not in a feel-good or philanthropic way, but as a re-examination of reliance, especially between human and non-human, and in dis disciplines where mutual care is rarely exercised. We'll see how human and planetary wellness are connected. And we'll hear about practices that promote slowness as a method, initiatives that attempt to regenerate and strike a balance between nature and human, works that question labor and privilege, and value spaces for the common good. Through this, hopefully, we'll start to look more critically at the contemporary culture of wellness and well-being, and go beyond the obvious of what the expression health and wellness typically evokes. I'd like to begin by introducing our keynote speaker, Natasha Petrisen Bachelez. Natasha sadly couldn't be with us here today, uh, but she has pre-recorded her keynote, which I'll be playing in a minute. She's an independent curator, editor, and writer based in Paris. Currently, the cultural programs manager at the Cité Internationale des Arts. Her research interests span empathy, transnational feminism, slow institutions, and degrowth. She's also co-founder of the Initiative for Practices and Vision of Radical Care, and her exhibitions and publications are really too numerous to, to cover here, but she's most recently curated the ninth edition of the Contour Biennial 9 in Mechelen, Belgium, and she'll talk about that more in her, in her talk. At the end of the presentation, Natasha will introduce our speakers in more detail, but we're honored to have Adib Dada, Paki Vasilopoulou, and Loile Ashragi, um, who will be uh, you know, talking more in depth about their practices. After these case studies, we'll have a short conversation, um, and if, if, you, you know, if you have questions, we can address them then. But uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Thank you for gathering for this talk about practices of care and commoning. My name is Natasha Petrician Bachelet. I'm joining you from Paris, France, uh, and I'm terribly sorry that I'm not with you in person, uh, but I hope that my uh, talk will nevertheless contribute to, to this exciting discussion on practices of care and commoning. Uh, together with our wonderful uh, speakers uh, and uh, guests that uh, I'm very honored to be part of. So I am, uh, I'm coming from originally from Slovenia. Uh, so I'm, um, you know, I have been through uh, the whole transformation of uh, this part of Europe that is known as Eastern Europe. And I believe it has marked my practice as a curator, as a writer. Uh, in, that, in the field of art, uh, in the fact that I have always uh, been looking into ways how art and culture uh, affect 
our social life, affect our political lives, affect our environments. I firmly believe that there is, a, uh, you know, there is all, almost a therapeutic um, component to um, us getting engaged and being committed or, or being in exchange with artistic practices um, in situations that uh, we perceive as uh, situations of any kind of injustice or, um, you know, such as at, at this moment in time of uh, pandemics, uh, of um, deep transformation uh, that is going on with our environment and uh, climate crisis. So I think we have uh, an important role to play as cultural workers uh, in in this um, in this particular moment in time, and um, I also now appear as uh, since some time I'm not no longer calling myself independent curating uh, curator as it is something that is quite known in the field for somebody that is not uh, related to a particular. Um, institution, but I, in, I insist on the notion of interdependence, um, and therefore, you know, go by uh, by calling myself interdependent curator. So I will, in my talk, uh, speak about um, uh, interdependency, about the role uh, it plays for me in understanding care uh, practices of care. Uh, and practices of commoning as something that uh, is uh, inherently collaborative, inherently mutual, inherently based on solidarity among humans, but also beyond that, uh, humans to non-humans and to the direct environment. Um, I'm starting with the um, uh, with this beautiful quote of Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a Potawa Tommy Nations author. Uh, she's one of the uh, most um, exciting authors in the field of uh, botany um, and um, uh, in the field of ecological sciences. Uh, and in her book, Gathering Moss, in 2003, she wrote that uh, this is a time to take a lesson from mosses. What is it that has enabled them to persist for 350 million years through every kind of catastrophe? every climate change that's even, even happened on this planet. And what might we learn from that? There is a lesson in being small, of giving more than you take, of working within natural law, sticking together. And I think that um, my thoughts here are not at all, at all my own thoughts only. And this is also what interdependence means. It means that everything we do, we do, um, in a relationship to one another, um, in a response uh, to one another, uh, be it between uh, you know, human subjects or human and non-human um, interactions. So I think um, the, the times in which we are, which are the times of um, learning to live with the pandemics, with the global pandemics, in a very challenging moment for, um, any civilization, any part of the civilization that we are um, belonging to, uh, of course, in different geographies and different political realities in a different way. But it is a challenging time that I think uh, strongly that should be reflected um, and have an impact in our cultural practices. And uh, in 2017, um, I already wrote a text um, that was called For Slow Institutions. It appeared in uh, Eflux Journal, among other, um, uh, among other platforms, uh, where, I where I learned from, uh, or where I, let's say, borrowed uh, the notion of slowness as seen by the eco-feminist philosopher um, based in Belgium, Isabel Stengers is her name who wrote in 2011, a plea for slow research. She is a chemist that works in the fields of um, studies of uh, social studies and the history of social studies of, of sciences as well. And she's an eco-feminist, which means that she looks at the environment through the lens of feminism, which is something that is also very uh, important and dear to me. 
um, and she wrote this plea for slow research after her colleague from the university has been fired because she, um, her colleague um, stood up uh, as a scientist, as a professor, um, and uh, explained her vision on uh, and her position um, against the uh, modific genetic modification of um, uh, of uh, potatoes and other agricultural products. And um, in this beautiful plea, Isabel Stengers insists on the idea of taking a step back from the wild uh, and immediate capitalization of our knowledges. And it's as something that uh, where the slowness, let's say, as, as, um, as a position, as, um, as, a, as a matter of approaching things should be um, the, that possibility of giving us time of giving us time to um, to think about what we do and how we transmit, uh, what we share, um, how we produce, how we think, um, to take that time and to rethink uh, this in a different manner than just in order that something that we do has an immediate uh, impact and an immediate product um, in the field of um, our own cultural field or scientific field. So I wrote in that uh, text that for me, slow institutions are, or this manifesto type of uh, text that I wrote is an invitation. I wrote it that it was for curators, but it's not only for curators, I realized today in 2022. Uh, but anyhow, quoting, it's an invitation uh, for curators operating in distinct geographies, but within an intertwined geopolitical reality to slow down their ways of working and being, to imagine new ecologies of care as a continuous practice of support, and to listen with attention to feelings that arise from encounters with objects and subjects. This is a call to radically open up our institutional borders and show how this work or don't, in order to render our organizations palpable, audible, sentient, soft, porous, and above all, decolonial and anti-patriarchal. In contrast to the competitive environment of institutions that foster so-called best practice models, the plea of Isabel Stengers to slow down research in the social and hard sciences offers an important alternative. Transcribing Stengers' call to undo the symbiosis between fast science and industry, let's think together about some proposals for how institutions of contemporary art can counter the imperatives of the late capitalist and neoliberal progress-driven modes of living and thinking. Decisions about fossil fuel divestment and institutional exercises to embrace degrowth as a necessary conditions in the global north are starting to take shape within institutions that deal with the past and future of cultural heritage. So, where I start from uh, is also in a way um, very much linked to um, the experiences that I could foster and enable in my curatorial practice. And uh, this also mentioned, of course, that uh, when I talked about interdependence in the beginning of, um, of this uh, short uh, talk, um, I very much am aware uh, and also very grateful that this notion is very intertwined within the thinking that comes from uh, very ancient Buddhist texts uh, um, and that has been really something that has been put in practice in, in um, the Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist ethics, uh, where the inter interdependence means that um, not one single event exists uh, on its own in its own autonomy, that it's something that always, uh, that all events and phenomena co-emerge, let's say. Um, and this co-emergence is also something that we see more and more taking shape as um, a very important um, fact or even reality in uh, quantum uh, sciences. So I believe it is something that comes from um, um, a necessity that we, I would claim as cultural producers and workers 
feel in our environments is to claim the very collaborative um, method and existence of our work and how this collaborative, uh, potentially non-hierarchic ways of working and sharing uh, of our practices should be much more acknowledged today. Uh, my uh, first experience was, um, and something that I always dearly come to back, uh, was based in um, running this place called Le Laboratoire de Bervilliers in uh, very, uh, it's in a, you know, suburban town, uh, northeast part of Paris, uh, where I have been co-directing the place for three years. Uh, and it's a place for artistic research in uh, both choreographic and um, per performative and visual practices. And we decided to invest this um, place here in front of the, uh, in front of the venue itself uh, to invest it with, um, with uh, workshops uh, that would lead workshops with children, workshops with um, uh, uh, citizens of that uh, town that were working on community gardens to talk together about the future citizen. What could be, uh, let's say, what could be the values of the future citizenship? And it, came, it became clear that um, this place here uh, was calling for being invested by uh, living matter. So we transformed this um, uh, uh, very concrete uh, um, uh, platform in front of the venue into a um, community garden where seeds came from all the citizens that were willing to share their seeds um, uh, with us, but with, uh, an an, with an invitation that the seeds should come from where they are from uh, originally. Uh, namely, this, uh, you know, in Paris, the suburban towns are places of high um, density uh, of cultural diversity. Uh, in Aubervilliers, in this place itself, more than 100 languages are spoken in families, besides French, which is the, uh, obviously the official language. And we wanted, in a way, to, to acknowledge that and to celebrate also um, the fact that a lot of uh, the citizens have um, some kind of uh, ancestral knowledge about the living, uh, the living beings themselves, be it plants or um, ecosystems or agriculture. And so uh, it was in 2010 that we launched this garden. And I'm most happy to say that the garden today looks like this. Uh, so, uh, 10 years after I left, uh, together with my colleagues from the directorship of this place, um, this garden, which bears the name La Semeuse, uh, which means the uh, sower, um, is uh, living its life, uh, has outlived already three other directors and continues to live um, uh, and thrive uh, in relationship to artistic practices that are being all the time organized in uh, relationship to, uh, to this garden and to its very plants themselves. So this was in a way um, for me uh, an important moment or important, let's say, verification of what I was just saying about the slowness and about the interdependence. In the, in the sense that whenever I try to uh, imagine new projects, um, curatorially or uh, intellectually, um, or in any kind of exchange that I'm giving uh, as a challenge uh, in my work, um, I try to think about it in the long term. So long term is again, another important um, um, notion when we talk about uh, how um, to think about care, how to think about care as um, not only caring us as curators, for example, for the objects or for the artistic practices or um, artistic um, uh, representations, uh, but also how to care um, in a way that would be mutual, uh, that would be mutual among the people involved in, in certain interactions, in certain relationships that would enable enough of time to um, 
to foster and to um, give a chance for these relationships to um, to persist. Because based on longer relationships, we can see that trust comes first out of this. So there is a, co a confidence and a trust that uh, emerges from any kind of long-term relationship that is based on ethical uh, uh, and mutual uh, interests. And this was something that I tried to uh, imagine within the Contour Biennale um, called Colton is Cotton. I borrowed the, uh, the title from uh, the poet Sorrel Williams. Uh, which was a year-long biennial that I tried to imagine in uh, uh, Belgium. Um, a year-long also because I imagined as a spine of this biennial uh, something that I call the transnational alliance uh, called We Cannot Work Like This, the Colonial Practices and Degrowth, which enabled eight different schools and their students to come together and think about the future think about the future of um, their own practices. They were young students of architecture, of graphic design, of intercultural work, um, of intercultural dialogues, um, social studies and artists. And so throughout the biennial we met, uh, we imagined, let's say, um, we imagined uh, spaces for meetings to be able to take a place where uh, we met uh, on regular basis with activists such as um, Justice for Grenfell or the, uh, the activists related to um, uh, the cleaner uh, cleaning staff uh, workers from Goldsmiths. Um, or we met in uh, social um, projects uh, in London or Paris or um, Belgium among other places. Uh, where uh, students had the possibility throughout the year to uh, think about ways of interacting with their, with their own environments in studies um, in order to uh, kind of break through, let's say, uh, the usual ways uh, of uh, working. And that's where the We Cannot Work Like This uh, uh, came uh, forth uh, and the this in We Cannot Work Like This was, of course, the what I was just describing before, the, the sort of um, practices uh, enabled by especially late capitalist drive that, um, you know, drive us towards more and more productivity and less and less time uh, to think about um, really um, the questions that matter. So these were... Uh, one of the most beautiful, um, again, results of this alliance was that a lot of those artists uh, that met here uh, during the alliance continued to be in touch after uh, the biennial was closed. Uh, and uh, not only that, but really imagined uh, many collaborations that came afterwards uh, and uh, which um, have... Um, uh, either came through as um, positions of political uh, enunciations um, regarding their own uh, institutions, uh, pedagogical institutions, for example, in Belgium, um, there was a huge movement, a political movement when um, uh, and support movement uh, again, for example, against sexism and racism in the institutional environments. Uh, but also it uh, reflected in many artistic collaborations uh, that happened afterwards. And um, on my way to uh, uh, end this uh, keynote, um, I would like to mention two other things, um, uh, two other projects actually that have been of great importance for me uh, and from which I'm learning constantly. Um, a project that was done by Denise Ferreira da Silva, a philosopher uh, from British um, uh, Columbia University, uh, who together with Valentina Desideri and Arelia Mo um, imagined um, uh, this project that we exhibited in Hamburg and in Paris at the exhibition I curated about uh, the concept of dehumanization in Europe. Uh, and the question was how the COVID pandemic affected the human. So they imagined um, 
a kind of setting for um, ancestral knowledges of divination techniques uh, to come together and answer this uh, crucial question that we are all feeling and are being immersed with uh, currently. And they presented it in this diagram uh, that I just showed uh, that uh, on one side uh, reposed on astrology, uh, tarot reading cards, uh, Amerindian uh, divination techniques, and uh, some more therapeutic somatic um, carrying practices such as Reiki or um, other techniques. And the two cards that came together was uh, the tower, um, which represents uh, always actually if you're um, familiar with tarot reading, the tower is always a place of uh, a place and time of um, a catastrophe that is either natural or artificially induced. Um, and in this sense, the catastrophe has always um, uh, represented in, in this particular case, the, the late capitalist system, uh, uh, or let's say the deviations in which uh, it dehumanizes uh, us humans. Uh, in its uh, system. And on the left-hand side, the card of abundance of 10 cups came out as a potential uh, result. So meaning that throughout their reading, they could see that if, um, if this moment in time of pandemics, um, there, sh there could be uh, a way of understanding that we should be pursuing, let's say, the our ways of working, our ways of being, and our ways of doing um, in, a, in a way that is full of solidarity and of um, respect and of care, then this potential card of abundance, which always represents a, a kind of ultimate happiness and inner happiness, not only uh, just, uh, you know, the card represents a very happy family here, but um, that this could be a potential um, outcome. And another important uh, work from Daniela Ortiz, who is um, a Peruvian artist, was to imagine how the seeds can also be uh, agents of um, messages of uh, rebel against the, uh, the, what, the injustice that has occurred in the past. So in a series of paintings in that same exhibition that, we, uh, that I curated, um, there was um, a wish to, to think through, you know, very um, uh, minimized message about the fact that the past uh, in which a lot of injustices have happened towards you know, various parts, in, in various parts of this world, and that we can think about as, as places of, um, uh, of colonial memory uh, and of colonial violence, that there are these non-human subjectivities that bury that memory and uh, a side of the humans, and that can actually, that have the agency, and Daniela imagines it in the series of paintings as something that has a possibility to, to strike back. And uh, to, I would like to end with this last uh, slide uh, that represents actually uh, an initiative that I started together with Elena Sorokina, curator, another interdependent curator, as me based in, who is living in Paris, like me. Uh, and we came with uh, this, um, uh, with this um, proposal to, to think about how to do things differently in our institutional environments um, in, again, very much, I talk very much from the Global North perspective and from my friends, uh, uh, from my French uh, perspective, uh, where I am, by the way, um, uh, a citizen of double, so I have double citizenship. I'm originally from Slovenia, so I also have this capacity to or let's say liberty to look um, uh, more um, freely and more uh, critically on my um, immediate environment, I would say. So we imagined or we, we kind of found it, uh, an initiative that we call Initiative for Practices and Visions of Radical Care, that um, has as its office um, under this beautiful cedar, Lebanese cedar tree 
in uh, one of the public parks of Paris. Um, it's, a, it's an initiative that um, works on the principle of, um, re of reciprocity, of mutuality, of friendship and of commoning. Uh, where we understand that through our competencies, uh, we are a group of roughly 20 cultural workers, uh, all based in, in and around Paris um, and uh, of very different backgrounds. Some of us are um, have a status of refugees, um, some of us are artists, some of us are curators, um, uh, filmmakers uh, or musicians. Uh, but what we what is um, uh, what is the red thread that brings us together is that we all are working on practices of care, and we all understand practices of care as uh, long term practices where care is something that is mutually induced and not just given, uh, and also not just represented. Uh, so we meet together in order to. Um, um, to check on each other's um, situation. Uh, so the initiative started in the times of pandemics. So the issues, uh, most issues of concern were of course related to health in the beginning, but also to maintenance of, of practices of care, artistic practices of care, which for us uh, are, um, we understand them as being very vulnerable in the light of uh, uh, the future outcomes of this pandemic that will for certainly affect also the financial aspects of um, the art world. And we want to imagine together how can we actually offer help to each other uh, through our knowledges, through our networks, through, um, through just very uh, immediate help in um, administrative financial solutions, etc., in order to, to understand this initiative as a kind of pool to which each of us can go to um, and um, ask questions, ask for help, um, expect immediate uh, help and responses. But also we are going more and more through uh, to the institutions where we talk uh, to see if there is within the institutions a real wish to, um, for example, towards uh, conflict resolutions that would be more based on ethics and uh, respect on feminist practices, let's say, um, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, there is also uh, one of the members of the initiative is uh, Kati Tutayasu, who is a um, sound artist and a shaman. And so through her also we, um, she's a Mary Indian from T uh, Tupinamba uh, nation. And um, she's somebody that reminds us of the, um, what it means as, as I say in this diagram, what it means to reside with the others. So we do talk a lot also to other living beings such as trees, rivers, animals, and spirits, uh, which for us are, um, as I mentioned before, the sources, uh, the sources of the memory and the, who bear also the potentiality to help us uh, move towards a more um, just society, I would say. So thank you for uh, your attention and I will uh, close here. And uh, thank you all for uh, listening. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Adib Dada. I'm the um, founder of this initiative called The Other Forest, a nature-based tool for ecological and social regeneration in cities. I'm the founder of The Other Dada, which is a regenerative consultancy and architecture firm working on environmental architecture and urban afforestation throughout the Middle East. And the premise is that at this moment, cities are not serving us well from um, you know, the urban heat increase, alarming cancer rate and cardiovascular diseases, environmental degradation, uh, very little green space, water pollution, landfills and all of that. Urban areas around the world are flooding. 
temperatures in cities are rising, traffic congestion is extremely costly and polluting, and our forests in Lebanon and all over the world are burning. Air pollution has reached really alarming levels, um, and in Lebanon, we have the highest death rate from air pollution uh, due to the burning of fossil fuels. Yes. <laughs> and so, um, so, the, so we have the highest death rate uh, in Lebanon, and then you can see also how uh, well the UAE is, um, is doing. But all of this to say is that how do we address the twin crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change? And it's about uh, rethinking of ourselves, recentering ourselves within kind of this notion that we are on top of, or at least man is on top of the pyramid, followed by women, animals, and then fungi and other organisms. And how do we recenter ourselves within a more uh, ecological um, worldview where we are all part of nature? And in my work, uh, I came to understand that the health of the built environment and human health uh, are related directly to the health of the planet. So we look at nature to inspire us. And from an architecture point of view, the idea is what if our buildings were safe and regenerative? So basically free from toxic chemicals uh, and beneficial also to the surrounding environment and communities. So what if our trees were acting like trees? and having uh, you know, like a skin that acts like leaves, so it's cooling the air through evapotranspiration, filtering pollution, uh, absorbing sound, um, providing habitat for birds, animals, and other uh, insects, stabilizing the soil, and basically regenerating the ecosystem where we're physically intervening. So this is one example of a project in, uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, where we used um, Basically, it's an inhabited landscape. So it's inhabited by humans and uh, nature and other creatures uh, using local forms, uh, local materials, uh, providing these little cracks and, and areas where um, organisms can also find a home within that, uh, within that structure. And of course, um, you know, recycling uh, the water and that water is being used in the landscaping. Uh, doing uh, even the pool is is um, is cleaned uh, through non-chemical means so that it's also safe for other um, creatures and birds to come and drink from it, and using uh, local native uh, tree species. But taking this a step further, what if our cities were as effective and generous as a forest, providing not only for ourselves as humans but also for um, other species as well, in perfect balance with the operating conditions of Earth? So we propose to, to plant dense native forests for resilient cities. Because urban forests help us in fighting climate change, in filtering air pollution, cooling down cities, protecting biodiversity, managing urban floods, restoring the water cycle, and improving physical and mental health. And we use a particular methodology called the Miyawaki method uh, of uh, afforestation because it is 10 times faster growing, 30 times denser. It sequesters 30 times more CO2 and more pollution. It is completely organic and extremely biodiverse. And it also becomes water and maintenance free within three years time. So with this methodology, we can design forests in any shape or scale that we want. We, this is an example that we did as a fence, and we can see the growth from basically, um, you know, when we first planted where the trees are really tiny, and then eight months down the line, the trees are already about two meters tall. We are also using the forest as an educational tool. And uh, we have been looking into planting forests in the desert as has been done uh, elsewhere in, uh, in, in Iran in India and in the US. So we've planted the very first native urban forest in Lebanon, inspired in part by the natural ecosystem of the Beirut River, because this is the Beirut River and it's natural, uh, still natural setting, but this is it in the city. So this is the dumping of industrial waste, which happens every you know, two to three years where factories dump their excess uh, dyes and other uh, things in the water directly. This is the dumping of garbage in the riverbed, 
uh, during the garbage crisis of 2015. And this is, so this is why we chose uh, this location on the banks of the concrete uh, sewage Beirut River as the site of our first uh, urban afforestation project. So here we can see two different phases where we planted. The first phase, which is already starting uh, to become green, uh, was planted in May 2019. And this picture is taken in November 2019, so six months later when we were planting the second phase. So you can see how this area, which had already been planted, uh, you know, you can't even see the trees, but then six months later, the screen is already uh, starting to take over. So the, the change happens pretty fast. This is, uh, these are some of the species we have. Um, so um, sage, laurel, uh, two different types of oak, hawthorn, uh, strawberry trees, um, and so many uh, edible and medicinal species as well. This is the forest when we first planted it. So um, again, here we have, uh, in this location, we have 200 square meters, 800 trees and shrubs of uh, 20 different native species. And this is it five months later, and this is it two years later. So I'd like to show you a, a quick um, video about the, the process how, that, we, that we go through. planting trees and a whole canopy around those trees. It's a beautiful initiative because you have so many hands coming together and the more hands, the faster we go and the bigger scale we're able to achieve. And uh, so basically this was in 2019, we did phase one and phase two, and just now in, um, in December of this year, we took over the remaining uh, bottom section of this. So this is the forest that we've planted two years ago, which has gone from this state to the state in just two years. And we took over this, uh, this part and uh, transformed it with the help of the community into a 2000 square meter urban forest and a big central public space in the middle. And this is our way of healing uh, the earth, healing back the, environs, uh, the environment of the uh, Beirut River and getting people back to this area, which used to be um, a place for people to get together on the banks of the river, to come together, to meet, uh, to fish and, and do uh, all sorts of things. So these are some of our other projects. Uh, this is uh, in, in Zouk, so the most polluted city in Lebanon, uh, in a road median. This is a, in a rural area, so in, the, in, a, in a ski resort, restoring the ecosystem that was there before. And uh, some of our latest work uh, has been in response to the explosion uh, in Beirut. So I'd just like to take a moment to, to acknowledge that and the lives, uh, the more than 200 lives that were lost uh, on that day. And uh, basically in response to that, we did uh, two types of projects, one of which is uh, planting forests with students of the schools that were uh, destroyed uh, during the, because of the blast. So it's a way for them to recreate new memories and then healing again by being in touch with the soil and actually ripping out the concrete that is prevalent in uh, school playgrounds 
to insert this sort of uh, uh, natural, um, you know, really tiny forest. And the second one is the remembrance forest, uh, which we planted uh, just kind of very symbolic, writing down the names of um, every single victim uh, of the explosion and then planting this in the ground. Uh, so 254 trees uh, planted. And the idea is that, you know, just kind of saying their name uh, out loud and having this, because there hasn't been any memorial. So this is kind of becomes of uh, like um, an informal memorial uh, celebrating the lives uh, that were lost. And uh, I will end with this project, Art, Ecology, and the Commons, which we've developed with Temporary Art Platform. Uh, and the idea is it's a program bringing artistic and ecological practices together at the site of the Beirut River. So it was a 10-day uh, study that we did. And these are different interventions by, by the artist. Um, this is a eulogy to the river by artist Sherbel Samuel Aoun, which reads, here lies that which was sculpted by water. Beirut River, born a million years ago and died in 1968. Um, the Water Fest by uh, Mirna Bemye, uh, taking, uh, uh, distilling water from all of the different uh, herbs uh, in the forest and then uh, doing kind of a, a festival of water where we did uh, water tastings, bringing people together and then finally a literal practice of care using essential oils from the forest uh, by artist uh, Petra Sarhal, learning from her grandmother to do these uh, essential oils and, and providing actual like massages and different uh, care practices. So the other forest is a nature-based tool for ecological and social regeneration in cities. By implementing this, we can regenerate degraded leftover lands into a shared space between humans and native fauna and flora all the while tackling urban flooding, reducing pollution and urban heat island effect. Essentially, we're working with nature to transition our cities to healthy and resilient communities. Reclaiming degraded land as public space, regenerating ecological systems and social connections. So, so far, 10 forests and counting, more than 3,600 square meters reclaimed, uh, more than 10,500 uh, trees and shrubs planted, and uh, with one goal of empowering communities to reclaim these degraded lands and turn them into a shared habitat for humans and other creatures to thrive. Thank you. So, hello. Uh, my name is Paiki Vlasopoulou and I'm a visual artist. I'm also a member of 3137 uh, that we did the artistic intervention for you today and I truly hope you liked it. So um, we are based in Athens in 3137. We are together, it's, uh, I'm not on my own, I'm together with Cosmas Nicolaou who is here and Hrisamthi Kumyanaki who gave a birth just a month ago and we miss her a lot but she is practicing care indeed at this moment. Um, so today, what I would like to share with you and to bring um, to add to the discussion is care as reproductive labor. And I will do so through giving you some examples of my own artistic practice, but also share some things we do with 3137 as well. Um, the title is, is this love, you will understand in the end also why, but I also to bring the parameter of love uh, when talking about care work and to question about it and I kept the, um, the subtitle like the working title because when talking about care work but also art practice, it's a question, it's a lifelong lasting question. I will use my notes. So in 2017, I had the opportunity to be a five-month paid resident in Antwerp, at Air Antwerpen. This invitation came in a moment where I had to do side jobs in order to sustain myself. Prior to my arrival to Antwerp, I was reading Virginia's Wolf book, A Room of One's Own. For those who don't know it, this book is an essay, it's almost a transcript of um, two lectures she gave in 1928 about women and literature, where after a very a fantastic, as she always does, um, breakdown of connection between women and literature, she ends up with a very well-known saying. 
A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write literature. And so with this in mind and heart, I arrived in Antwerp, ready to grasp the opportunity of um, being paid for a period just to practice and think of my work. Further on, when an invitation came by the curator of the residency, Alan Querings, for an exhibition, I was sure that I wanted to refer to my prior living condition before going to Antwerp, but also to what I felt when reading Wolf's book. So maybe as you can sense from the, from the image, ah, the exhibition was a, a day image where each artist had a 30 minute slot to, produce, to display um, their work, like uh, do a screening, a performance, whatever they would choose in this time frame. So I decided uh, the exhibition took place in, in the yard of the residency, that there was also a pop-up bar. And I decided to go with a performance, as you can uh, see, which is a serving performance. I asked from the coordinator of the program, Frederick Veda, and a, per and a performer to serve for 30 minutes the guests of the exhibition. Uh, holding these ceramic utilities, I've made uh, like extended wine carafes and serving place, and the neck carafes, the handmaids I did, and also the bricks attached to their shoes. And uh, what uh, the, the piece uh, was stemming from the distance between the person who is being served and the person who is serving. And I wanted to touch upon women's role as a hostess and a caretaker and question social work regardless gender. Something that was very important to me was the, um, the invitation to Frederic, who was the coordinator of the program, because I also wanted to point out like um, the unseen labor also in the art field. We know all these big exhibitions with the very celebrated curators and artists, and sometimes um, the whole backstage team stays um, unrecognized. Um, Adding to that, uh, yeah, I said so. So we'll go to the next project that will bring us closer to what uh, reproductive labor is and why I was interested in that. In 2018, I was invited in an exhibition in the Archicultural University of Athens um, where I came across of this object, which is an old um, cow breast stimulator that would uh, teach the students how to milk a cow. Also at that time, my best friend Josetta um, had just gave birth to her child and I was introduced for the first time to um, the contemporary breast pumps that I didn't know before. So taking the line from the unseen labor I mentioned before, I started being interested in the domestic sphere and work and the very old demand about housework wages. I was introduced to the work of Nancy Fraser, an American scholar and philosopher, where in her text, Contradictions of Capital and Care, argues that reproductive labor, traditional touch to women, of course, has been undervalued in relation to economic production, traditionally attached to men, to men. and she writes, Non-waged social reproductive activity is necessary to the existence of wage work, oh, Non-wage social production activity is necessary to the existence of wage work, the accumulation of surplus value, and the functioning of capitalism as such. None of those things could exist in the absence of housework, uh, child rearing, schooling, affective care, and a host of other activities, which serve to produce new generation of work workers and replenish existing ones, as well as to maintain social bonds and shared understandings. Social reproduction is an indispensable background condition for the possibility of economic production in a capitalist society. So the piece I made back in the Agriculture University um, took the title Practicing Pleasure Where Possible. The ceramic exhibits borrow the forms from modern and ancient breast pumps and the objects are found in the school, as well as sound producing objects such as megaphones and fives. All ceramic objects have holes from both sides in an attempt to refer to the action of transfer of liquid, air, sound, but most importantly to that of feeding. 
the metallic reads that function as showcases make reference to the gossip table. Gossip table is a piece of furniture that consists of a sitting area stretching to a table where the telephone is located. In Greek, gossip table has a female pronoun, and even worse, we use the same, um, the same name for the gossip table with that of the gossip lady, gossip women. So the ceramics hanging on electric cables, highlighting the idea of transformation and physical substance transmission. This piece acts as a, as a score and no to the idea of care that is emphasized through the use of soft towels, which is also very usual material in sculpture and uh, ceramics. Overall, with the work, I, ex I explored the transformation of society from agriculture to industrial, underlining the different roles uh, the woman takes on patriarchal Western societies. The piece was located in front of the ceremony hall of the school, where in these marbles in, in the back, there, are the, there is a list of all, with all the past deans of the school, which are all, of course, all of course men. Um, so I think uh, the link between uh, the two things, like the work that is celebrated and this that it is un unseen, I think it's quite clear, and that it is the labor that is necessary actually for a system to function. I will, I have six more minutes, so maybe I don't have to rush that much, but we will see. Um, I will go now to the work we do with 3137, um, where 3137 is actually a space, the image is not, ah, yeah, it's a space, is where we practice our individual practices, and it's uh, also where we run a program, a public program since 2012, and as a, as a trio, we also do uh, sometimes um, uh, projects uh, abroad as the one today. Um, so one of the main aspects of what we do that it's is sharing our personal space. So going from uh, notions of hospitality in my work, I think some of these notions exist also in what we do also in our common space in Athens, in Exarchia. So uh, I tend to, I'm interested in linking, I'm um, going from the domestic space to the public space and from the personal to the collective, from the single, the single to the collective. Here is in 2012, one of the first dinners we made, which is outside of our studio, which was set in a first come, first served manner. Uh, besides the performativity of the work that I won't get into details now, is that uh, we, wanted, we were sure that we wanted to serve also the people that they weren't able to sit in the table. So food sharing is an act that can connect um, uh, the domestic with the public and it's an ancient trick of how to bring people together, together and create uh, a, a common experience. Since then we have done many projects around food, but one that I would like to share with you today and I think it's worth mentioning is a benefit dinner we did in 2015 with a state of concept and an art organization in Athens and with the artist Maro Michalakaku. Um, we were, uh, as quite small organizations at that time, uh, we'd done everything on our own, worked in a DIY uh, situation, and we were the hosts, the performers, um, the waitresses. So as you can understand, I wanted to stay in the, um, in the economy behind the, uh, the notion of care. Uh, because I do believe that if we change the way we perceive labor and economy when talking about care is, is, is a way to understand productivity um, in, a, in a new way, in a different way, and to also recognize the efforts of uh, those that uh, do all the, the labor to sustain the system. And now I will uh, go more quickly to the last project I want to share with you, which is around labor, art, and the erotic audition. This is not a love song. 
It's a publication we did last year together with Ilaria Conti, a curator um, that back then she was uh, work, she had just finished her work in Serge in Center Pompidou, and now after two years of um, being stuck in Europe, she is finally going uh, because of the pandemic. I mean, she's going back to the um, U.S. Um, the, the, the book is around uh, the working conditions in, in the art sector, so going again to our common uh, working environment. And what Ilaria brought to the table at that time was the idea of aura, aura that she, she thought of this hell of power that uh, stays around uh, and above art institutions and professionals. Um, what we try to do uh, through the book, we try to materialize um, this idea through different ways, but um, the book has a great contribution in Europe and in the US. I won't uh, go into detail in order to be able to uh, share all my thoughts with you, but where I want to, to stay is into the parameter of love. Uh, to bringing in the to in the beginning, uh, where law for uh, for us stands in this in between a situation of passion and uh, work, all these efforts that we do, um, thinking that we are doing something that we really love, but this uh, could lead us to um, could le lead us to an an. Uh, under recognized, uh, under uh, paid uh, collaboration. And um, to conclude, and I went really fast, excuse me, I hope you were able to follow. Um, what I wanted, um, uh, what I, where I want to conclude is that uh, thinking of uh, care work, if we end the fair art ecosystem, if it is um, to create one, we are, uh, we have to recognize that the sustainability of the system comes uh, from care work and from the work um, happening in the background. And it's uh, important to also monitor the work that we do. So this is in the end of the book, where it's like in these pizza slices, you count the hours that you work, and in the boxes, like the different aspects that you had, the different uh, things that you had to do in a day, and to share the personal with the working uh, time, and most importantly, to embrace um, care as an aspect of what we do, and to understand that the knowledge contained in reproductive labor, like the, the knowledge that um, stays there, can lead us to a different understanding of production, first of all, so to understand product, uh, producing in a different way, and to feminize our uh, work and life, and to produce more uh, solidarity as and Natasha greatly said in the beginning that is very needed in, for our life. So thank you. Uh, Hello, Falava. My name is Leoli Shradi. I am presenting Knowing and Being Where We Are in Great Ocean Visual Arts as part of this panel and wish I could be there in person with you in Dubai. Ilene Tula, Avea Yellow Leo, if I'm of Fungata Molimoli, Lefalapat Potonga, Atangata Mau Io Nipaluna, if I tell of Atum of Afelo, I at Lepa Iamala Malo Leaso, Tato Malo, Fao Alomia, I Maisilipa Iamala Malo Ole Neta Yao, if I knew Atangata Mau Io, Muinina I Malato Io, Maloles with Fua, Maloles with Fua Manuia. I recognize the relationships, knowledges, and governance of lands and waters in the occupied territory of the Muinina people of Nipaluna, from where I speak to you today, as well as those indigenous peoples from where you are joining me. I bring my Samoan, Persian, and Cantonese ancestors' teachings of good conduct and peace to this gathering. In this short presentation, I will trace my lived experience of land recognition or acknowledgement of country practices as a curator and critic, as I have just pronounced one. These are what I would qualify as practices of humility that decenter humans, strengthen ceremonial binds, and challenge enlightenment held 
biases as transposed and expressed in the settler colonies of Australia and Canada. For the tens of thousands of years that Indigenous polities and peoples have thrived across the territories occupied by these settler states, both so-called Australia since Gregorian year 1788 and so-called Canada since Gregorian year 1604, are very young, if powerful, presences. I will close with delving into reading rooms as sites of collective care for co cultural memory co that constitute and hold space, in particular for local and diasporic Indigenous cultures, intellectual and aesthetic practices, which continue under duress and erasure in these same nation-state contexts. Institutional statements of land recognition or acknowledgement of country in both so-called Australia and Canada have come about as forms of acceptability politics in recent decades. From recognizing the place of the institution and or event as taking place on lands and waters long inhabited by currently colonized, displaced and oppressed Indigenous peoples, these statements abide by many local Indigenous protocols in various territories. They also do not imply any concrete measures. In their most formulaic repetition across the cultural sector, at the outset of meetings and in email signatures, to equity, to redress, and to the undoing of ongoing colonial impacts on named Indigenous peoples. So, understanding that to individually pronounced recognition of Indigenous ownership and custodianship of lands and waters indelibly altered and occupied by settler colonists, overwhelmingly but not exclusively drawn from European empires, there is a distinction to be grasped here when such pronouncements are made by the institution particularly when major cities host important and well-resourced culture institutions located directly upon Indigenous villages, cities, burial and ceremonial sites. These statements of land recognition or acknowledgement of country are performative and like any application that might alter financial, political and sociocultural domination. Indigenous activists, artists and curators have repeatedly made calls for measures that go beyond the symbolic to encompass unconditional return of funds, lands, waters, cultural collections, and the hiring and to the hiring and retaining of Indigenous employees across organizations, and particularly in roles with budgetary and programmatic oversight. To paraphrase the canonical 2012 essay by Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, even by its title, decolonization is not simply a metaphor, a trend. It is a demand, it is a demand for genuine and unconditional restitution. In the case of the Archive of New South Wales, I can speak from experience working there in sharing that any and all meetings that cover First Nations cultures, art practices and peoples are required to have multiple First Nations members of staff present. This is a solid gesture of recognition that is more than simple lip service and is in addition to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advisory group of elders and industry experts that provides counsel to the institution. I am inspired by Cyrus Marcus Ware's important essay, Give Us Permanence, in Ending Anti-Black Racism in Canada's Art Institutions, Alison Cooley, Amy Luo, and Kiva Morgan Fears' piece, Canada, Canada's Galleries Fall Short, The Not-So-Great White North, on the overwhelming white stable of solo shows, Sean O'Neill's piece, A Crisis of Whiteness in Canada's Art Museums, on the ethnic makeup of senior leadership and boards, and the 2020 piece by Travis DeVries, What the Arts Can Learn from Black Lives Matter on decolonizing institutions. I am informed by many conversations, essays and exposés with Indigenous and settler co uh, colleagues across Canada, New Zealand and Australia, which bring me to the conclusion that the visual arts sector needs to be more honest about performativity and recalcitrance. By performativity, I mean the semblance of allyship and humility towards Indigenous and diasporic Asian, African and Great Ocean aesthetic and intellectual practices and by recalcitrance, I mean the resistance towards any ambitious unsettling of the status quo in so-called Australia and Canada. Thankfully, regional art museums often collaborate more openly with Indigenous and racialized curators, public programmers and executives, despite the usual temporal nature, temporary nature of such collaborations due to institutional size and the means of engagement. The Australian Museums and Galleries Association, AMAGA's visionary report, First Peoples, a Roadmap for Enhancing Indigenous Engagement in Museums and Galleries is a collective voicing by First Nations peoples and authored by the Indigenous-owned law firm, Terry Jenke and Company, on how increased presence and sovereignty can be achieved. As has been learned in many a boardroom or open plan office dominated by a certain privileged population, the presence alone of non-white peoples is not enough to effect a change and to fulfill the promise of land recognition or acknowledgement of country statements. 
there must also be a deep soul searching and the redressing of the status quo from top to bottom, from department to department of curatorial decision making in these territories, so called Australia and Canada. From 2016 to 19, I edited in collaboration with local and global Indigenous colleagues and peers across Turtle Island, Hawaii, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Australia, two directories of our representation in public art museums, centres of contemporary art, media, and art schools. These community responsive tables were edited intermittently by all of us in an effort to locate where we were and where we weren't. I would keep everyone abreast of major updates through posting about the tables into the How Do You Say MFA in Your Language private Facebook group founded by Haida Canadian artist Raymond Bajoli or the Indigenous Curator Collective, Collective de Camisas Autochtones public Facebook group. Most alarming in our findings five years ago was the trend of double the Indigenous identified curatorial roles existing in Australian public art museums and centres of contemporary art than in their equivalents in Canada and conversely, double the number of Indigenous and other racialized academic appointments in Canadian art schools, with the gap significantly widening through successive ambitious cluster hires. All this while academic and student demographics at Australian art schools remain as dominated as ever by the Anglo-Celtic majority, with the Womanjika Jimbana Indigenous Research Lab at Monash University Art Design and Architecture, and the Contemporary Australian Indigenous Art Program at the Queensland College of Art at Griffith University, being the exceptions rather than a trend towards reparations and redress of historical inequalities. Despite the, recent, despite the numerous recent cluster hires in Canadian art schools, only Concordia University with the Indigenous Futures, Indigenous Futures Research Centre and, and OCAD University with Wapata Centre for Indigenous Visual Knowledge are dedicated spaces for Indigenous creative agency and research that concretize the promise within often repeated land recognition statements. <clears throat> the most recent iterations of these tables of representation were completed for the Colour Chart, a research creation residency I undertook last year with the University of New South Wales Galleries, and which culminated in an essay published in Art Monthly Australia and the artwork Kinship Flag, with which I opened this presentation. Black and brown leadership has not yet reached the highest levels of executive direction, though the Art Gallery of Western Australia, Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, National Gallery of Australia and Australian Museum have all recently brought senior leadership roles focused on First Peoples into place with respected First Nations peoples at their helm. At the Mackenzie Art Gallery, Musée d'Art Mackenzie in Regina, Saskatchewan, the development of an equity task force with binding timelines and deliverables has been welcomed as a solid institutional commitment to change, redress, and reparative measures. While ongoing, this is a notable outlier across the many cultural institutions operating in so-called Canada and Australia. Speaking of the problematic representations and participation in literary world-making of Latinx communities in white-dominated Quebec society, Karine Rousseau reiterates that to truly testify to a fuller sense of Americanity or hemispheric consciousness, white que Quebecers must <clears throat> embrace their foundational diasporic narrative and muddy it with acceptance of complex intersection, intersectional histories of Indigenous and racialized immigrant minorities. I would extend this from Canadian institutions of culture to Australian institutions of culture, where in a once in a generation soul searching moment of reflection brought about by neoliberalism and the COVID-19 pandemic must be the occasion of a holistic rebirth of these institutions for futures of relevance and collective ownership to be theirs. To bring this discussion of land recognition or acknowledgement of country statements in the context of the concrete measures that such performative and sometimes formulaic pronouncements can actually have, beyond the few examples of equity task forces and Indigenous advisory groups across the sector, I want to return to a project I curated in 2016. First Languages of the Monash University Collection sought to align new writing in, indig in Indigenous and non-English languages with works by celebrated First Nations and diasporic racialized artists within the Monash University art collection. This came about through multiple years of discussions between curators, faculty members, and myself as a then PhD candidate at the same institution. I commissioned new writing by indigenous curators, Clotilde Bullen, Kimberly Moulton, Kara Kirkwood, 
and Pedro Wenaimiri, as well as fellow PhD candidate Chilean curator Camila Marambio, on artists Lilia, Lilia Balbal, Juan Davila, Kitty Cantilla, Tiriki Ones, and Ricardo Bumba Peterson, some of which were in turn translated into Chilean Spanish, Tiwi, and Mardu. Monash University Museum of Art was able to continue this project for two more years under the expert ages of curator Shepperton Art Museum Belinda Briggs of the Yoru Yoru people and Zoe Rimmer of the Pakana people, who is senior curator of First Peoples Art and Culture at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. Both of these curators commissioned numerous texts and translations, which together are present across Monash University campuses and when viewing the art collection online. The aspect of this project that I am most proud of was working closely with Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung artist, dancer, and translator Mandy Nicholson, and Bun Wurrung senior elder and translator Narwi Carolyn Briggs, who is senior Indigenous Research Fellow of Practice at Womanjika Jimbana Indigenous Research Lab, to realize a land recognition statement that was translated into both local First Nations languages, Woi Wurrung and Bun Wurrung. This statement greets visitors at the entrance of the Monash University Museum of Art, as well as online and is one of the rare examples of such translation in cultural institutions in Australia. Though it is evident to these two First Nations that the voice behind the text is the settler colonial institution, of course. Another form of Latin recognition or acknowledgement of country that has been deployed across mostly curatorial but sometimes also artistic projects I have been involved in leading in recent years is the Reading Room. With all the structural barriers for First Nations and diasporic racialized communities, leadership in cultural institutions and in education, educational spaces in so-called Canada and Australia that I've discussed until now, reading rooms that serve as sites where Indigenous cultures are centered and critically appraised became pertinent and an obvious strategic use of space for me. The reading room is a spatial offering to audiences and institutional staff alike that can make modes of passing time, sharing poetry or narrative, researching, studying and reflecting, challenge the all consumptive imperative under neoliberal capitalism. I deployed a reading room in my 2019 commission, Tanata Nu'u, for Sharjah Biennial 14 exhibition, Leaving the Echo Chamber, Journey Beyond the Arrow, curated by Zoe Butt, as an intellectual and aesthetic anchor space to the performance installation in the adjacent gallery. Particularly is I was the first, very first Samoan artist and only the third great ocean artist to exhibit in Sharjah alongside celebrated Napuhi Natihina Ngaitu artist Lisa Rehanna in Sharjah Biennial 14 and after Haku artist Taloi Havini in Sharjah Biennial 13 in 2017. For Tangata Nu'u, the reading room comprised cushions, plants, important texts related to the content of my performance and its installation to indigenous languages and aesthetics of the great ocean and Turtle Island, North America, as well as to our orators, literatures, and tattooed narratives. As a curator, critic, and artist from one of the archipelagic indigenous peoples inhabiting the center of the largest oceanic expanse on this planet, I am used to navigating the bounds of education and literacy in our art forms, histories, and aesthetics. Hence, this more generous gesture of the reading room the commute held at the Institute of Modern Art Brisbane in 2018 was the first in a series of transoceanic exhibitions reflecting and speculating on ancestral trade and ceremonial routes across the great ocean, as well as future connections between peoples and kin creatures. The following exhibitions were layover at Artspace Aotearoa Auckland, New Zealand in 2019, and transits and returns at the Vancouver Art Gallery, Canada, 2019 to 20. The first exhibition featured generally generously supported commissions by eight artists and a five person indigenous curatorial team to greatly enhance the support in dreaming up, funding and realizing the artist's dreams, visions. In each exhibition, we also included a space for gaining transnational literacy in the aesthetic, intellectual and linguistic spaces, practices sorry, of the artists and curators represented. Through reading rooms featuring either my personal collection of global indigenous art history, theory and curation, or texts purchased specifically for an exhibition, these spaces are a way to encourage collective tending to cultural memory and traditions more ancient and yet more vulnerable to erasure from outside a perceived, from being outside a perceived European canon. Through the presence and reading, studying, sharing of various publications, but especially through individual and collective activations, organized or random. The physical and relational library of sorts constitutes and makes real the promise of learning and being through Indigenous art. 
All this despite the significant structural pressures of settler colonial states in so-called Australia and Canada, wherein erasure and marginalization are the usual experience of indigenous art practices and histories, and most of all, of territories and peoples. Thank you for your attention today, and I welcome any questions, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. I'm sure we have many questions for Dr. Ashragi, and it's a pity that he could not be with us, or they could not be with us um, this evening. But I'd like to invite our presenters today for a discussion amongst ourselves and then a few of the people in the room. Um, I'd like to begin um, by uh, inviting Byron and Cosmos, members of 3137, who are here with us today. Hello. Um, and returning to the film that we saw at the beginning, uh, Digital Druidism, and the notion of um, individual wellness, um, and the onus sort of being on the individual for self-care, and the idea that you know, in, in the face of increasing digitization, especially the, the last two years that we have lived through, um, which has kind of increased alienation somehow. Um, you know, and, and our precarity feels even more <laughs> pronounced. Even more pronounced, um, how do we, how do we sort of, like, how does your work, um, uh, you know, tell that experience. There is, it, it really felt with that figure of the individual running through the city or moving through those dis different digitized atmospheres that there's a kind of uh, uh, individual that you are pointing towards. Um, and also if you could tell us a bit more about this Element. talisman that seems to match <laughs> my outfit very well today. <laughs> First of all, thank you for the question. Uh, it will help me to present our common work. And I would like to thank all of the, in the team, al Carl, you, Kevin, Smithy, Bader, everyone, that we are here. Uh, personally, and in 3137, we have a long-lasting relationship with the space, uh, with the place and al Carl. so we are happy being back. Um, before I answer to your uh, question, I would like to add something that somehow gives an information for the piece, but also gives a, a first layer to the, uh, to the question. Um, in 3137, we curate the program and we, we, have a common, we, have a, we have a communication and discussion piece between us. And it's a space that we discuss our common uh, ideas. And this is somehow the program comes to the fore. But uh, now in in 10 days, we are turning 10. So after 10 years, we, having, we have a body of work to have done together. But in the beginning, it was not like that. So our common practice uh, brings to the fore our interest, our interests and our some ideas. And also uh, by time passing, we work with other people. And also for this piece, let's say, if we, if we say it very, very by the book, that creative direction was done by us. Chrysanthi, Paki, and I. And from the implementation, we have a collective um, creative discussion with Daphne, Daphne Heretakis for the video, uh, Marios Vitis for the sound, that we worked all together, but we were having also a, a discussion, and with Byron for the talisman. So, But it was not as, uh, an individual part, like we were coordinating the discussion. So. It's very interesting that uh, it's very to the point what we're asking about in the individuality, but also um, the piece is a common effort. So um, the whole idea was like, we started from uh, the idea of uh, creating something like um, uh, has to do with a pose, a meditation, a meditative atmosphere. Then it came the, the idea of uh, rituals, 
personal rituals. And somehow from one thing to the other, also it came the idea of uh, sound and light of a non-verbal gesture. Also, I would like to thank you for saying the work film or video, I don't remember. Uh, I wish it, it can stand as a film or a video, it's more an intervention. Uh, so, uh, we, so we started, so we stopped this day with this discussion and we started again with the idea of light. So uh, I have to reveal now that the light uh, show, the lighting show that we started in the beginning, it's inspired by the Emirates aircraft, that they have a specific lighting for relaxes your nerves when you're flying different, to different time zones. So we create this long gesture of bringing people together, attaching uh, their, triggering their uh, senses. And then um, by talking about the, um, the, the, the idea of a, a, a routine and, an, and an also an individual practice that you do by yourself and also it's for, your, for, for the good of your health, for your mental uh, stability. Also we realize that sometimes all these kinds uh, of hobbies, they are becoming elements of your CV, of your representation, digitally and physically. So we played with these different layers. So in the reality, uh, we had the discussion, we did the art direction, and I'm running myself. And this is one of the routine, my routines. When I don't have time, I run in the road. When I have time, I go in the little, this little hill. And you can listen to my brief that it, I'm not an athlete, so you can listen that I struggle. <laughs> and we realize that uh, I do it, but I struggle. Uh, so we realized that uh, all this, um, we took this um, decision with Daphne to, to, to wear a GoPro on my, on my head. So this image was very digital. So step by step, th this, all these elements that we have together were integrating in the, into the piece. So we would like to create this um, uh, point of critique about what is physical and what is uh, digital and how we live between these different um, layers that are becoming more and more aware nowadays. And also then uh, we, we, we turn around a lot, we looked, around, we looked a lot the idea of enhancing, of boosting ourselves. And also with the last two years that medical papers are coming to the headlines every other day, and everyone has a medical opinion for the vaccine mm -hmm. or for whatever, um, we talked a lot about the boosting and enhancing. So we would like to have a symbol that can, uh, in an absorbed way, bring this uh, element of care to the fore. But also this, is, uh, this um, symbol in, engineered by Byron, together with Byron, and he's a very good, uh, beyond very, very good artist, he's a very good designer. So you can see that this could open and it works perfectly because of his <laughs> engineer ability. So this talisman is a jewel, but also it works as a pill case. So we had this and it's, we distributed empty. So the idea of like, it's a kind of a, of an, on, of a call, of an occult, of, of a, like of a sect that we are running, we meet every night, every day for something that is abstract and it helps us, <laughs> but also, you can boost yourself with your food supplements. That also it's between care and boosting, physical and uh, artificial. So we try to bring all this layer in a critical way. And also we'd like to do it also in a way that triggers the senses. That's why the long shot in the beginning was only with colors. Uh, mm. I think yeah. I talk about that, <laughs> but I can we'll, answer. We'll come back okay, to it. Of course. Um, Byron, would you like to add anything more about I the I think from um, touching on something that Cosma said in terms of how the digital, digital meet the physical, I think one of the processes that we use to f manufacture this is uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, which mm -hmm. is part of digital uh, fabrication, as it's um, so-called. And in that, design happens purely in a digital space but then is uh, materialized kind of um, out of nowhere in mm -hmm. uh, in like a physical form, fully functional. And yeah, and it was kind of uh, uh, the right trajectory, I think, from how the methodology of the project uh, uh, unraveled. Thank you. Yeah.
And it's interesting also this sort of urban forest environment that um, that becomes this kind of lung uh, space in, yes, in the yes. video. It's five minutes from our studio, five minutes walk. Wow. Um, which kind of brings us naturally to talk about Adib's project. And Adib is, uh, I guess, um, working uh, through an organization called Another Dada, based out of Beirut. Um, and it would be nice, Adib, to hear not just about the organization, but maybe also to go back to some of the ideas that Natasha introduced in her um, presentation around this idea of the long term or the long durée. And of course, working in Beirut at the moment, you are constantly responding to crises. And it was wonderful to see how this current disaster has been somehow commemorated and folded into your project. But of course, the very act of planting a tree is also a gesture towards the future. Um, and it's interesting to see how this kind of temporality plays out in bringing a community together in the present, but also speaking to a community to come. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I started this project because I, you know, I've, I've been working and researching the state of the Beirut River. So this kind of concrete sewage river that, you know, the, the current system had deemed as not valuable. So they just concreted it and threw all this sewage in it and then the garbage and then, you know, everything else. So it's how do you revalorize these types of spaces, the leftover spaces and all of that. And um, after, you know, after a while of, of kind of, you know, a lot of activism work and all of this, um, we found that, you know, we can't really necessarily impact that, you know, social class or the political class. But what we could do is that we could start implementing the change that we wanted to see and that we needed uh, also for our own um, self-care. And um, this is where the idea that, like, came to, to, um, to restore that forest that used to exist next to the river. And that's our indirect way of bringing people back to the space. So the space that used to be very vibrant before 1968 and then became totally like a no man's land. It was an urban landfill, um, you know, before, before we got to it. And, um, and the, the act of planting a tree is not, um, uh, how do you say, like, uh, it's not perceived as a political act, it's not perceived as threatening. So it bridges across, you know, our like political, religious polarization we have in Lebanon. And it's like everyone's be like, oh yeah, planting a tree, yes, of course, like that's a good idea. Uh, but for us, it's actually a very political act because by planting, we're actually reclaiming that land that is not valued by the current system. And we're reclaiming it in, a, in an effort to give it back to the community, whether that community is like a human community or the natural um, community. And of course, it's happening right now, but it's a project that will, you know, hopefully outlive us, outlive us and, you know, be left for future generations. Um, so this idea of temporal temporality and not responding to the crisis as it's happening, but actually also taking the step back uh, <coughs> and thinking about the future, you know, what are the future crises that are coming and what, do we, what can we start doing right now? So that's, that's where this comes from. <coughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, and I think that also somehow links back to Dr. Shraggy's kind of uh, talking about the ancestors and what we can learn from indigenous knowledges. And I think especially in, in this region, when thinking about desertification and planting, those, those techniques really need to come from the region themselves. Um, Paki, my last question will be for you. And then if you have questions for each other, uh, I think we can continue. But um, let's talk about love. <laughs> and, and the question I had is, you know, in, in the kind of emotional labor that goes into the type of work that you do in, as an individual, uh, as a feminist within 3137, how do you do this kind of uh, research into the conditions of precarity and, and labor and and, you know, I guess exhaustion often, um, but still maintain our, your ability to remain vulnerable and to remain generative and to remain somehow generous. Yeah. It's interesting because I do realize now that I was saying the economics of care, but it is 
the word money, I think, that comes with love <laughs> <laughs> and creates love a and contradiction <laughs> there. So, um, uh, yeah, well, this is what I wanted to point out, that when it comes into um, uh, everyday life, into um, trying to maintain yourself, your family, your um, uh, community, there is a need of uh, material um, reimbursement. Um, and that if we realize um, the depth, as you said, the, the emotions and um, the time consumed in these um, uh, aspects of uh, being together, which is about care, and we, we celebrate them and give them, that's why I said not to commodify in them, but to uh, really to understand, value. to value, exactly. Yeah. Um, then I think in different, of course, uh, places, there is a different way to, to research more and to, um, and to go deeper to it and to implement it into, into the life. So, yeah, I mean, in Greece, uh, now we are in a moment that we're discussing a lot about um, unions. They're back in fashion. And... Um, Anyway, so this is a way of uh, bringing solidarity again into the art field and thinking uh, care as, as, the, as a way of treating others and that brings, um, that create bonds among the members. So this is um, the whole thought of it. And this notion of, I guess, commoning and care and collectivity is something that, um, you know, uh, should be, in a way, uh, obviously well-resourced, well-funded. Uh, but also I find that cultural institutions are, are having to take on the work uh, of public service, of kind of providing infrastructure, of providing, um, you know, the, the space, really, of creating the space. Um, that that it, maybe a generation before us, uh, especially I guess uh, pre-liberalization, <laughs> um, you know, was provided in other ways. And I think um, you know there is a need um, to form more public-private partnerships and actually find more sustainable funding models and working models. And I think we're living through a really interesting time where, where this generation is, is really starting to question even the value of work. Yeah, and yeah. I think we're very lucky being in a sector that we can talk about non-hierarchies, as Natasha said. Mm -hmm. So when, when talking about these uh, formations, these, these type of synergies, and like also art institutions as a place of work, um, if we manage, I do agree with the first part, as we were discussing before, for sure. And um, I'm also very worried for other aspects from, for example, in Greece and in Europe, that um, uh, many work that the state or, an, yeah, that the state should take care of is now into NGOs, for example. So I think there is a similarity there in terms mm -hmm. of of the refugee crisis in Europe and et cetera. But yeah, in the other hand, we are very privileged. We don't have to solve the things, but we are very privileged working in a field where we can talk about different understanding of hierarchy and working relationships. Did you want to add to that, Adib? <laughs> um, I mean, it, again, for us, it's, it's this kind of, um, we have to take into our own hands these practices that you know that we want to see. So we need those spaces and we need to create them. And um, as we've seen, when we have a completely dysfunctional system, uh, whether in Lebanon or abroad, it's it's the NGOs, it's civil society that's stepping in, and it does become very uh, uh, it's heavy because you know like you're solving things that you're not necessarily like meant to be meant to be working on. Uh, but it also comes from uh, our work on the ground, from listening to people, from understanding, you know, what they're going through, and and also in a way, it's maybe it's a little bit selfish. Like in my case, it it brings me a bit of clarity when I'm when I know what I'm working on. Uh, given the very volatile situation in Lebanon, 
at least I have like something that I'm following that I know, I mean, that in my gut I know is, is the right way. So it uh, helps also, helps me to, to calm down and, uh, and keep going. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, these uh, parts of the, you are working a lot close to the river as far as I can understand. It's one of our major uh, sites. And you're planning to continue as far as it's, as it's possible, huh? So the idea for the river project is to really reconnect the natural um, forest, which is up in the mountain, all the way down to the coast. Ah, so, you so to do like a green corridor um, uh, alongside the river, from and the natural river along the concrete. Uh, and the concrete this, uh, cori this corridor will also help the quality of the water uh, in the big scale? Or? So it doesn't help the quality. I mean, it, it will help the quality of the water in the parts where... So raw sewage and all sorts of waste are being dumped directly in the natural valley. Okay. And they go through the natural valley mm. and like sewage waterfalls into the riverbed. So um, some parts are no longer forested. So by recreating those, you're helping uh, filter out this, uh, this water. But in the city, there's absolutely no, I no mean, our, forest is, uh, our yeah. forest is not connected to river, yes. but mm -hmm. it's a way of us getting people there to like, you're raising public out, consciousness. You know, they're like, the what is behind that concrete wall or what is that smell? Mm -hmm. And then they discover the river as opposed to me for six years shouting, you know, there's a river here. Why don't you do something about it? So this is like just, oh, why don't you have come? Why don't you come and have a picnic? And then, you know, there's a surprise. Um, yeah, the Miyawaki method that you were talking about seems like it, it could be something that could be adopted across many different regions. I mean, this is our intention, is to really scale this uh, type of uh, approach because we see really, um, I mean, incredible visions uh, in the UAE and mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia on planting millions and billions of trees. But we also mm -hmm. see a lot of failure yeah. um, here and around the world on the way that these are planted. So there's always this saying that it's not about any type of tree. It's like the right tree in the right place at the right time with the right kind of maintenance so that it can, so in our case, in three years time these forests become self-sufficient mm -hmm. because we're actually planting you know using that indigenous knowledge we're planting the indigenous we're bringing back the indigenous ecosystem back to life which knows how to take care of itself so it just needs us to catalyze it to bring it back and then you know it, it can uh, take care mm -hmm. of its um, of itself Cosmos, i wanted to come back to 3137 and the rhodiola project uh, which, of course, also relates back to um, this idea of self-care and optimization, but again, um, you know, trying to uh, create a socially engaged project where people can encounter um, and have those discussions. Um, could you say a few words about that project? It's not all. Yeah, I would, yeah. uh, uh, English is not my mm -hmm. first language, but I would like to add the word resonance. Mm -hmm. we, we, I think, I'm thinking this word as a key word for that project because it was a, a place for resonance that you can be, you can see things that maybe are referred to you and also are similar to you from another view. And also it uh, came to the fore of an idea like it, it's like a radio station that have frequent, different frequencies. So, um, also, I think that uh, the idea of uh, Rodiola was about that, about well-being. Let's mm -hmm. say the idea of, of well-being in different uh, views, in the, the, uh, the well-being in the community life, body well-being, mental well-being, um, uh, physical well-being. And also the, um, the idea of uh, creating this... Um, uh, the, the, also, the, the, the common bridge between then and now is like the idea of uh, branding is very heavy word. The idea of image, what is the, the public view of that? What is the profile that will be creates? And creates a capital that on one hand, it's like very bodily and physically present, but on the other hand, can be like a way of man to manipulate your image to have added other kind of added values. Mm -hmm. So I think that we played. Uh, I, I I wish that we are more to the to the center of this question now, every, in every step that mm -hmm. we take. But this is the idea of how how this well-being from a trend can be also a way to reflect and see things that can 
make your life better and also create habits and uh, uh, behaviors that can be like uh, can foster better uh, communi communal experiences mm -hmm. and procedures. So it's it's a lot about enhancing. Yeah. I don't know. Enhancing in English sounds very economical sometimes, but I I I, I use the word I like survival it. skills. Yes, it's yes, about yes. collective survival skills. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Let's and, say like. And I think it, it, it okay. This is a big. Um, um, step, but anyway, I think it also link in taking back also an idea of wellness and ritual of yourself after um, yeah a, a, an extreme um, um, isolating. Uh, no, no consumerism about consumerism. It. Yeah, because as uh, I mean, as uh, Europeans or like uh, raised in in with the U.S. Uh, tradition, with you Western want, culture. Yeah, yeah, Western mm -hmm. culture. You want to but also I have claim to say that as Rodiola as is uh, the mother uh, the new with a newborn uh, mm -hmm. is a specialist in uh, food supplements yes that's the trend how I the take trend. it regularly I yes know so she, she, <laughs> she, invent, she invented the name back then yeah, because it was the pill that she was taking yeah. back then so again we made a pill case for Rodiola <laughs> <Yeah>. pill <laughs> thank you um, Thank you so much for you. for being with us today. I think everything we've talked about feels even more sort of urgent and relevant. Um, and hopefully the conversation will continue long after today. Thank you for inviting us. Um, if we could, I think someone has a clicker. There's information about uh, upcoming programs. So we're talking about food and the future of food on the 26th of February. And then we will be back for Water Week at the end of March. Thank you. Thank you.